Uh, my name's Frank Kelly, and I'm here with uh, Giles. So we're talking about, a st uh, you could say, a small project we've been working on that um, puts data science uh, to a good cause, really. It's, um, and it's a cause that I've been personally affected by, um, and uh, we think it's very much worthwhile. So we'll explain a bit about what we've been doing. Um, we're going to talk a bit about the way we've looked at this problem and identified features and then built some models and then tried to draw conclu conclusions and we'll share some of our, our findings and results. Um, okay. Sure. Is this, is this better now? Okay. So <coughs> what is our goal with this? So we'd ideally we want to develop a way using data to diagnose Alzheimer's disease as early as possible. Um, so a little bit of background about Alzheimer's disease. Uh, <coughs> it affects millions of people around the world. It's the most common form of dementia, say 70% of dementia is Alzheimer's usually. Uh, there's a quite a shocking statistic in the UK. There are about 800,000 people in the uh, formally diagnosed. Is that better? So in the UK, there's about 800,000 people who've been formally diagnosed, but there's perhaps a million more who, who have symptoms of Alzheimer's, um, and yet they don't really know, and they may go all the way through to sort of chronic stage of Alzheimer's without being formally diagnosed or treated, which is quite a shocking situation. I th I'm sure you'd agree. So, and it's... It's going to get worse, unfortunately. Uh, if you look at um, population demographics, so the chart on the left is, is showing that as, as populations get older around the world, uh, so the ratio of people who can care for people who have things like dementia is, is, uh, is, is diminishing. So the, that's the ratio of dependence <coughs> on the left. And on the right, a country like Japan you're going to see, yeah, the, the number of people suffering from something like Alzheimer's or dementia is going to triple. So this is a huge problem. So <coughs> who are we? Well, I've introduced myself and Giles earlier, but there's a couple of other people working uh, with us on this. You could say it's a part-time side project. So we get together once every three weeks or if at best every two weeks over online. One of us is in Canada. The girl there, Maya, and there's a chap on the right, he's in Spain. Um, we're both in the London area, but we managed to get online and do a little bit of hacking and playing with data. And so it's really, this is just a project on the side. We're not, we're not um, no major promises about what we can achieve with it, but it's, it, we're here to share what we've, what we've done. So in terms of our, yeah, our thinking, so Alzheimer's disease today is usually diagnosed by a trip to uh, a GP. So starting with, um, they look at your, your medical history, they'll perform some tests, uh, and it, you know, it, it's, it's a one-time event. So you, you come in, you have a test, and you've, you've suddenly, you've got <coughs> Alzheimer's, you're diagnosed. Um, and eventually, you know, you can go up to doing brain imaging and eventually dissecting the brain to really confirm that Alzheimer's has taken place. Uh, but we know that uh, Alzheimer's is really a, it's a gradual decline occurring in the brain. And so the diagnosis period is you know, usually between, say, 13 years um, and six years before the, the person dies. But if you look it can, it can, you know, it often happens up to 20 years before that the conditions start to happen. So there are many benefits from for you know earlier diagnosis. Not only uh, in terms of the individual and their, and their families, in terms of their planning and responsibilities, and you know they're reducing their anxieties. Uh, also, there's there are interesting developments in terms of drugs that, that may be able to slow down the effect of the disease. And if, if more people can start to be on drug trials earlier, then, then I think that bodes well. Um, and the, you know, a potential cure, we'll, we'll be closer to, to looking at cures and, and really ways to, uh, to tackle.
tackle it. So looking a bit of, at, at our, so we, how do we start out? So we, we thought we'd look into the, the domain area, get a bit of knowledge uh, before diving in to, uh, to, to you know, creating features and doing some analysis. So Alzheimer's really manifests itself by, well, the, le the leading hypothesis is that you have these protein plaques that accumulate in the brain uh, and they really disrupt communication <coughs> between cells. Um, I'm not sure whether they actually kill cells. I'm not a domain expert. Um, I understand there's been some experiments when they manage to stimulate um, neurons in the brain and, they, and memories were able to be brought back afterwards on mice. Um, so I'm not sure how, it w and, and, and I don't think even the leading experts entirely understand the cause or the impact of the disease. But what we do know is that it starts in one part of the brain, uh, which is the hippocampus. So this is where, where our recent memories are, are formed. Um, and then, and <coughs> so, that, so the earliest symptoms you'd see is short-term memory loss, um, difficult to, people having trouble recollecting certain of recent events. Um, and then, the disease um, progresses through the front part of the brain and moves on to areas such as language processing um, and, and eventually goes through logical thought, emotions, uh, the senses, uh, and, and onto sort of older memory. The rate of decline, we know it varies for men and women, that's been recently discovered. Um, but eventually, of course, this will lead to, to full shutdown of the brain because the even the, the sort of life support systems will be eventually shut down. So how do we turn this into to a, to a data science problem? Well, we think we took all the symptoms that we could read about <coughs> in, in various papers, um, and we tried to match them roughly with this timeline. It's all very approximate. Uh, but we, we tried to think about where we might get some data. and we. We started with the idea of uh, written correspondence uh, because it's already digital, easy to access. Um, so in terms of what we could pick out from people's written correspondence, um, we selected these features. So starting, it's also trying to find features that would tally with early, early so the earliest symptoms and, and that part of the condition. So these three. So so language problems, so memory issues, and change in sentiment and mood were areas we, we decided to focus on. So previously, I, I don't know if some of you come to the PyData meetups, I did a lightning talk. And we, we started out by picking up a single uh, Alzheimer's sufferer's emails and doing some analysis. So. We converted emails to, to vectors and eventually counts and numbers and, and extracted a few features. So here we got readability over time. Uh, over so the, a the age of the patient was between 78 and 82. And yeah, she's actually the grandmother of one of the people collaborating on this team. Uh, the thing is, whilst we saw some there's some example emails there that we were looking at, for example. We saw some sort of trends over these four years. It's hard to really be conclusive. Um, and looking at email in general, we made a lot of inquiries and we spoke to some organizations about getting access um, to volunteers' emails. The problem is people, there's a lot of security concerns and, and people um, actually often delete their emails so we decided to, to change tack slightly. So I'm gonna hand over to Giles now. He's gonna talk about our approach. Okay, so um, yeah, one of the big issues with email is how do you get hold of it? Um, and that's pretty tricky. So we looked around for other places we could get the data from, and uh, the Alzheimer's Society UK forums was the most accessible place where we could get a lot of written data 
uh, produced by both sufferers and non-sufferers of dementia. Um, so we've used the I Have a Partner with Dementia subforum um, as uh, our counterpoint to the I Have Dementia subforum, uh, which we hope will allow us to control to some extent for age and education of the subjects. Um, so there was an initial LXML um, scraper that we used, and um, we rewrote this later into a beautiful soup, which basically made it easier for us to get more uh, content from these posts. Um, so we scraped two subforums, um, 3,600 threads approximately, and about 30% of those were started by sufferers of dementia, or at least that was the subforum they were in. Um, and 78,000 posts. Unfortunately, the majority of those, as you might expect from non-sufferers, or rather in the non-sufferers, the partners forum. Um, so we grabbed the post content, the metadata, the user metadata, and output that lot uh, to a couple of rather sizable data frames. Well, sizable, not perhaps in terms of big data, but um, that gave us something to, to play with. So um, Beautiful Soups uh, made things very easy for us. Uh, we did a little bit of text cleaning, but not very much required, uh, just the bare minimum um, to um, put things into NLTK, basically. Um, we removed uh, the quotes from the posts. Uh, you can imagine that could contaminate any signal quite significantly. And uh, used rare gaps just to tidy stuff up a little bit. Um, nothing complicated. Uh, so um, you've got the user metadata frame, or a small chunk of it, up on the right there. You can see that we have issues with some posters post a lot, and other posters only post once or twice. Um, so uh, we, we do have issues with various biases in the data. And um, the actual post content, uh, with the record of the, the thread it's in, um, the post count is very important, so the first post uh, in the thread um, is the one that we prefer to use to classify a user. It, uh, if they've um, started a thread in, the, in either subforum, we can probably assume that they're, uh, we can classify them appropriate to that subforum, whereas if they're replying, then they could be a dementia sufferer, sufferer replying in the partners forum or vice versa. Um, so that's pretty difficult. So labeling the users uh, is a bit of an issue. Uh, right. Okay, actually, Frank, this is yours, I think. So, <coughs> so, yeah, we we determined a source of data, and wh what was our strategy? Well. We just we wanted to you know, engineer some features that would match the symptoms I've described, and uh, we wanted to somehow aggregate these posts uh, in a way that, we, that could be uh, sort of analysed and have features extracted from them in a meaningful fashion. Uh, we also wanted to select a few models and do some classification. So something on user classification here. I think, Giles, you wanted to talk about that? So how do we label the users? So um, unfortunately, individual users rarely, um, sorry, fortunately, individual users rarely start threads in both subforums. If they do, uh, we discard them. Uh, so there's only 12 in that case. So we don't lose too many users. But replies in bo both subforums are common. Um, and uh, so, if we look at some examples here, um, we can see that the first user in this frame, um, 18 Roy, well, he's only posted in the partner forum, so that's fine. We can classify him as a partner. He started the thread and he's replied a couple of times as well. Um, Mindy, um, that's uh, fairly clear. She's started 13 uh, threads. And uh, although she's uh, replied to a few posts in the um, the partners of uh, 
sorry, the Dementia Sufferers Forum. Uh, she's replied to a lot more in the, the Partners Forum. Uh, so we can confidently think that she's a partner. Um, two Js. Uh, so this one, I, if you were not being too cautious, uh, you would classify as a partner of a dementia sufferer because of the ratio of, uh, of posts here. Um, but uh, in fact, uh, we've taken a cautious approach and it's a compromise between uh, the, the quality and the quantity of data we have, but we've, we've thrown out anything that's ambiguous like that. Um, 53 Sharon has uh, started and replied to threads only in the dementia forum, so we're pretty confident that's a dementia sufferer. And 60's child is a really difficult one because they haven't started any threads and they posted almost equally in each subforum. So unfortunately, um, that's data that we, we wouldn't use. So uh, in summary, we discard users who start threads in both th forums. We're also currently leaving out users who reply to threads in both subforums. Um, we could use those that predominantly reply in one subforum, um, but for reliability, um, it doesn't give us much extra to work with, so we just bin that data. Um, so that gives us, unfortunately, two quite biased um, groups of users. We have a lot more uh, partners of sufferers, um, but it's something to work with. So over to Frank. So once we'd established more or less who a, <coughs> who a user is, um, whether they're a sufferer or a partner, we weren't entirely sure. We didn't manually go through every single post, as, as Giles said, but we got a, you know, we were fairly confident about our initial data. We decided to design some features. So to start with, we just put some very basic uh, features to do with counting, counting words, counting sentences, and unique words, uh, word count. And encouragingly, if we plot histogram of posts, we see differences straight away. So we see that um, sufferers are generally, they seem to be writing longer sentences, which sounds strange. Uh, but it might be, we, we figure, because they're not maybe using punctuation uh, as, as often as uh, their partner, for example. Um, so we see a, a sort of a wider spread, more, more variation. Uh, there's things like, uh, yeah, sentiment. There's a package called text blob you can just pull out and you can, it's a fairly basic procedure. You're able to, to analyze the sentiment of every word in the sentence. So we saw that also, quite strangely, they, the dementia sufferers tended to have um, more positive sentiment than, <coughs> than their partners. Now, it could be because of their sort of state of mind. It could be because their partners are more worried than they are. Um, there could be many other reasons. It could be just noise in the data at this stage. So, but that's sort of initial patterns we're seeing. So a couple of other features, things like go ahead words, just um, uh, this sort of thing. You, you wrote, we wrote a function to sort of count these in, in the post because that's a feature of um, Alzheimer's sufferers according to several papers. So for w we looked into, yeah, with Alzheimer's, you tend to get a loss of lexical function. The vocabulary tends to diminish. Um, and people tend to use words out of place. So they might use words <coughs> that they've uh, come up with themselves or words that really aren't relevant to what they're talking about. Um, and then there's general comprehension of what they're saying. So something like a readability metric uh, should help us with that. So readability metrics, we, we found a quite a good package <coughs> called um, readability LXML. It runs all of these metrics for you straight away on, on the text. And here's a couple of them plotted. So what, what we see again is, is reflected once more. So there's greater variation within the dementia set um, uh, in, in all of these metrics. But the there's a tendency for, <laughs> strangely, the comprehension 
to be um, so, so it's slightly harder to read. So, so the readability metrics are aimed at matching sort of an age group, as, as in people aged 13 to 16 would have no trouble reading this, or no, it's actually uh, only people aged 10 to 13 could read this. So we, f we found that the dementia text was actually harder to read. So without trying to read too much into the, the reasons behind this, um, we explored the data a bit further. So plotting, plotting on two dimensions, uh, these, are the, these are individual posts plotted. So these are different metrics. I don't know if you can read the uh, axes, but there's things like Dale Chow readability, which is made up of sort of number of uh, difficult words and, and, and the number of words per sentence. So you see the, interestingly and encouragingly, you see the dementia, the, the, the sort of increased variation. It's almost like the dementia sufferers posts are sort of breaking away from the norm, as it were. That's what we could see. So after exploring the data sort of post by post, yeah, oh yeah, sorry, there was um, a memory-oriented feature as well. So we just did a very simple comparing. We just used pandas group by and ordered, ordered all the posts. And for each user, we, we semantically compared the post with the previous post uh, using cosine similarity. And we're just comparing two vectors there. And I tried another one, uh, part of NLTK package, the edit distance which I think is related to the number of characters you have to rearrange in a sentence to make it uh, match the previous one. So this is to do with people repeating themselves, basically. And we'll see if we can quantify that, measure that. So thinking about in terms of how now we have the feature set, <coughs> what are we doing here? Are we, are we trying to make a prediction of whether someone has Alzheimer's? Or are we trying to just explain the causes? Well, in fact, we, we need to undertake both approaches. So we start by training a classifier to find out which variables influence <coughs> Alzheimer's that we can see. And this will be explanatory. And then eventually, we need to work on a predictive power in terms of determining you know, when, you know, when, when is Alzheimer's starting to happen in somebody that's an unknown. So in terms of our initial explanatory modeling uh, phase, we, want, we started by aggregating the user's data. So we took uh, median values. Um, and so for each user, we took all their posts and worked out the median of the relevant metric. Uh, and we did some sampling. Uh, we, did a, we had a holdout set as well. And yeah, this is the the fire alarm system is operating in city gate house. There you go. Do not okay. use the links between these buildings until further notice. Okay, so the model result, so we, we decided to group our features into different. Um, the fire alarm system is operating in city gate house. Just carry on through that. So the first group were the sort of miscellaneous features, so uh, we put sentiment. Um, from the, the first metrics I showed you. So we, we just put a, f we, we ran a few different uh, classifiers um, and the results were not that great, as you can see. This uh, ROC curve is not brilliant. Um, the sentiment came up as top. This seems to be a key sort of differentiating factor. Uh, then we looked at the memory features, slightly better, so 63% accuracy. Um, but the precision isn't amazing. Uh, and it seemed to be this cosine uh, similarity metric. We tried the mean and the standard deviation to kind of for the fact that, that we'd aggregated the data and, and just the, the mean on its own wasn't telling us much. Um, that came up on top. The readability uh, features, once more um, aggregated, not so great again to 59%. Uh, but this Dale Chow, this readability, the one I plotted earlier, this is a feature of importance. We were just using uh, the random forest uh, function to be able to explain the importance of features. It came out as a, as a really important metric. Um, and then we did some parts of speech. So breaking the sentence down, determining what 
what the type of each word. Uh, so we looked at adjectives, nouns, um, and uh, pronouns, and verbs. And we're able to calculate a rate, as in how many verbs divided by how many words in a sentence uh, within a post, and then aggregated over all posts for that user. And so, um, got two minutes left. So, yeah, we found that this support vector machine radial basis function uh, seemed, to, seemed to do the best. Um, but again, not brilliant. Uh, and when we combined all of the features into one uh, model, uh, you yeah, so we're getting about 63% accuracy. And there's a sort of uh, a mixture of between readability, uh, sentiment, and memory uh, features coming up. Uh, so we, but we, we had a, a slight uh, uh, change in tech. We decided to classify posts and not users. But the problem is we found that so many more, uh, there are many more partners than dementia sufferers on the forum. And in general, partners were writing three times as many posts as, as dementia sufferers. So we had to sort of do this double round of sampling so we'd even up our data set. But that paid off, and we got a sort of accuracy of up to 68% with a random forest classifier. And this is the only slide where I'm brave enough to put a confusion matrix on, because the results were getting, looking a bit more encouraging. And the, and the memory feature came up top. So just to, just to wrap up, memory-based features seem to do the, the best. And the best performing individual feature was verb rate in the case of aggregated data. But if on individual posts, it was cosine similarity to a previous post. And this, this, this um, falls into line with what we you know, determined in terms of early symptoms. So we want to look into many future avenues, including um, grouping of users, improving every phase of this uh, pipeline, so getting better data to start with and classifying users to start with in a, in a clever fashion. We want to collect more features. Uh, we want to do different kinds of classification and move on to the predictive element, which will probably involve some kind of time series analysis. So we thought about, we noticed this dementia sufferer here. If you They've been posting a long time on this forum, and we see like an increase in, in, the, in the variance. So maybe that's going to be a way to, to detect for certain features. It might be a change in the mean, like a ramp. So we've got to, it's something we want to look at. So I think I have to finish now. We're all, all done. So thank you for listening to us. Uh, we, we hope we've sort of given you an, an intro introduction to Alzheimer's, some of our initial um, findings from this uh, very small side project. It's a tough problem, but we think it's worthwhile. Um, if, if any of you would like to help and you think you can do this a lot better than us, then please get in touch. Uh, you can come and chat to me afterwards or drop us uh, an email online through the links. Thank you very much. <laughs>
So it would just alert people. It might say to you after reading your emails for a few months, it might say, well, can you, can you make an appointment with your GP? Or just go and have a chat. Um, and so it's, I suppose it's better to yeah, err, err on the side of, say, 80%, 90%. So, so this is uh, really um, more of a curiosity than something deployable, um, and it's a very long way off that. Um, obviously, in anything medical, any false positives or any false negatives are a big issue and t tend to scare people. Um, so, you know, there's massive doses of caution would need to be applied to anything that, that comes out of uh, the other end of this. I think that, so that was, I think, feature importance of okay. the different features, which is not the same as um, how predominant those features are, the nouns and the, and the verbs. Um, so, uh, yeah, and again, just, no, it was maybe it was. <laughs> well, it was, did, where did you see it earlier on, did you? <laughs> but it's, it's just, it's just determining that it's, it, we don't know whether it's more or less, actually. It's just determining um, okay. that it's, it was important in the classifier. So my, uh, my sort of prediction for the kind of text that uh, any kind of dementia patient would use, including Alzheimer's, would be that they would um, use more category general words to describe natural signs. And I was wondering if you're interested in looking at that kind of thing or have looked at that kind of thing. Definitely, yes. Um, uh, so, is, are you working in this? Are you working in this domain? I mean, uh, not specifically with Alzheimer's dementia, but with another type of dementia, and um, people who have most types of dementia are likely to use uh, like a word uh, like animal, for example, to describe a dog, right. which uh, a, a neurologically healthy person would not do. They would say the specific word dog, or even you know Labrador or whatever. Um, and I was just wondering if you've looked at what kind of words they use when they talk about natural signs. We haven't gone into that uh, level of detail. Mm -hmm. The one thing that comes to mind is that they did tend to use more difficult words, so l fewer common words. I don't know if that tallies, though, with what you're okay. saying. Okay, so when you say, you mean just words that are less frequent? That's right, in okay. the English language, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you. Thank you. The text blob, yeah, that's right. The experience was that it was very easy to use and to get set up. Um, you don't, yeah, it's it's got its own pre pre um, sentiment analyzed vocabulary, so you can just throw it a sentence and it'll it'll return the sentiment. Not not not. Not as yet, but that's it's going it's on the list. Yes, yeah. Do you have any recommendations? Cool. Okay. <laughs> Right, yeah, so we have thought about that and we, we want to add more forums so that are unrelated. The thing about the partners is that they're of a similar age group usually to the dementia sufferers, so there are presumably factors that occur just to standard decline for during old age, uh, so that was a way of normalizing that. But yeah, you're right, they're going to be worried and that's why they're Posting three times as much, maybe. It's and yeah, it's it's definitely a factor. So, 
Yeah, so at different forums, uh, there was one, like, I'm a carer of an Alzheimer patient. Uh, and, yeah, we may just pick some completely unrelated ones just to see how the, how the, the features tally. Thank you. So we probably have time for two more questions, and then we'll let you get fed, fed and watered. So, um, yeah, Thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, I've looked at a similar thing where you look at the features and talk features. Sure. And obviously, the annoying bit is the replay and how it's technique as well as process. I don't know if you've done any work on the building on how your features are changing the um, classification. No, for now, we've just used the simple the, the output from the random forest in, in, in scikit learn. Um, w the only thing we did was to, to group the features initially and try them out in, s in separate groups. So that would give us an indication of the sort of main areas. But you're right, we should do some more careful feature selection and, and observe the impact on the model directly. Yeah. What would you do? Would you just run it? Just, I mean, how, how would you, because I, I can across the same problem, how would you divide it? Yes. Um, yeah, there's various approaches. Um, yeah, you can have a chat afterwards if you like. And, yeah. I just uh, want to add to that we've done very little in the way of optimization. We haven't done proper hyperparameter searches. Uh, you know, very much trying to sort out the methodology, and then we've just thrown the data at classifiers and seen what's come out um, with practically no tuning. Uh, so it's not very sophisticated at this point. So we probably have to wrap things up. Um, can we have another round of applause for our great speakers?